Barb Higgins here, welcoming you to A Thousand Tiny Steps. In this podcast, I share my stories of love, loss, triumph, and tragedy as I continue to trace my steps backward and ponder what led to the death of my daughter, Molly. If you're ready to laugh, cry, shake your head in disbelief, or simply listen, and tie, buckle, slip on, or lace up your shoes, and join me as we begin our A Thousand Tiny Steps. Hey everybody, Barb Higgins here, welcoming you to episode 82 of A Thousand Tiny Steps. This has been a difficult episode for me to record, and I can say this at the beginning of the recording because this is my second time doing it. I find that in telling stories like this, I have to walk such a fine balance between laying the blame on everyone else and gossiping versus telling the story, giving equal credence to both sides. In this journey of mine, I have to own what's mine and let go of what isn't. This has been a challenge for me. In the process of telling this story, as all my listeners know, I've read books and done research, met amazing people that have had lots of the same experiences I have. I just had a meeting with my editor for the book that will be released, my memoir. I believe we're going to call it Because I Knew You, which comes from a song that was played at Molly's memorial service. But Right now, it's just called American Mother, but it's all about Molly's death and all of the things in my life leading up to her death and in the, in the aftermath. And so, of course, Roy and my relationship with him is a big part of the story, especially because I was with him at the time that she died. These next few years leading up to her death, I've had to really relook at and read old text messages and looked at old journal entries and gone back on Facebook, it's it's tedious sometimes, and every memory evokes all the emotions that occurred with that memory. But what stands out about the end of 2013, 2014, 2015, is that a lot of the legal dramas and the big public dramas abated. They settled back. Robert had tried to appeal his restraining order to the state level. I spent hours on this very, very exhaustive appeal, and he withdrew it. He just said he would keep the restraining order. He wasn't smart enough to do it. It's what he said. And so life sort of settled in. And this is when I look back on my relationship with Roy and my relationship with Kenny and the girls. And I just created this dual life. Years ago, there was a movie. I think it was called Arthur. But it was a man that had two families. He had a wife and children and a wife and children. It was also a really good book, The Pilot's Wife, I believe it was called. And it was a similar thing. It was a man with two wives and he had one living in Europe and one living in the United States. And he would, you know, fly back and forth on his trips and have these separate lives. And sometimes I look at my life, I look back on it and I feel that way, that, that I was the one that had created this dual existence. Now, having said that, nothing in my life was secret to Roy. He feels and claims that I hid a lot from him. I didn't consciously hide anything. I didn't necessarily share everything, I, but I never... I never didn't answer a question. And he was very inconsistently, but very concerned that I was, you know, he was just waiting and waiting and waiting and living this life where he sat in his apartment alone and did nothing. Did not want that for Roy. He also is far too social and and he knows too many people for that to actually be, be what I think was happening. But I didn't live there with him. I do know during 2014 and 15, there was very, very sort of constant pulling back and forth between us where he really was putting his foot down that I had to leave Kenny and come and live with him now and bring the girls and do, do whatever it took to be together. And then there were times when that sort of started to come to fruition where he would immediately pull back or disappear for a bit or push me into reestablishing myself here in Concord with the girls. And so these next two years are almost like a dance. Along all of the undertow of Roy and I, It was my friendship with Robin, which I had mentioned before, I had been warned by a dance mom that Robin, just to be careful that I could potentially get hurt. And while I hadn't seen that side of Robin to me, I had seen that side of her to other people. And if I had people in my life that I cared for that she didn't care for, it was very, very tender footing to discuss those people. She made it very clear that she would prefer that I like the same people she liked or disliked the same people. And that was how her life functioned. I hadn't known her long enough to see anyone else but me as her bestie, but I do remember feeling in the beginning of our friendship that she suddenly just loved me and wanted to be with me all the time. At the time, I felt it was just her being kind and genuine, but I realize now that people that function under the narcissistic umbrella 
look for people that are hurting, that are easily manipulated, that will believe what you tell them, and that ultimately need you in their lives. That was Roy when he and I first started, and that was Robin when she and I first started our friendship. I was this decimated teacher. I had a very public image. Kids loved me. Her children, her youngest daughter was in high school when I was teaching at the high school. All she heard was how awesome I was. I was a track coach. I was in the newspaper. So when all of this happened to me, and it was sort of very public and very off-putting and very traumatic, she jumped right in. So all of 2012 and 2013, you know, the beginning half of that year, I became engrossed in working at Flips. I was there all the time. I also became engrossed in CrossFit, and that was something Robin and I did together as well. So I suddenly had this life that had me busy seven days a week. I was working at VLAX teaching. That was online. I did that at home. Then I was working at Flips Gymnastics. I was coaching and doing fitness and everything. And I coached the littles on vault because I was a good running coach. And I had had a good understanding of core strength. The movements that the younger gymnasts did on vault, I could coach. I did a lot of birthday parties and, and overnight events at Flips. Molly and Gracie got to enjoy all of this. And it was really one of the happiest times of our lives at that time, in the midst of my job loss and all that was going on, we had a lot of really happy moments. As 2013 rest and then moved into 2014, Penny's health really began to deteriorate. He was no longer able to work in a way that he used to. He could work a couple of days a week, but not a lot. His business really started to fail. So all of the money-making was on me. It was in 2014, that I started coaching at Bow at Bow High School. And so this was another source of income for me. It was sort of a re-entry into public school and coaching and all of that. It was, in my mind, a bit of vindication around my job loss. I remember that Roy was happy for me in that regard, but he also was very frustrated that I wasn't getting a coaching job near his home in Massachusetts, that I was just staying ingrained and in Concord. But then there were other times that he was very, very supportive of that. You know, you better have work a lot. You have to pay your bills. You have to care for the girls. I was in a place where I really, truly went to him for my advice. Our visits during this time were wonderful. They always were wonderful. We often ended in an argument, like, so I would leave to go home and we had been in an argument. And I look back on that now as sort of a fairly consistent pattern. I believe that whatever life Roy had, where he lived with his people in his town, my presence had to be explainable. And I think sometimes he created a reality that was easily explainable by him as to why he stayed. I knew and he knew that uprooting the girls and upsetting their life was not something I wanted to do. Kenny and I, our marriage ended. We actually got a legal divorce during this time because of all of Kenny's financial issues. I didn't want to lose everything to the IRS because of Kenny. And so we divorced in the summer of 2014. And I remember taking a picture of my divorce decree and sending it to Roy. And I thought he would be happy about this. This was something that he pushed for and pushed for. And he basically said, well, it's just a piece of paper. This was another pattern that was evolving. I always thought it was really black and white. It's just me and Roy and that's all of it. But I do know now, having reached out to people in our, in our lives and people in his life during those years, that the picture in the portrait he painted of me didn't always match at all what was happening, but it created a, a workable reality for him. During this time also, Teresa, Teresa and Morgan both were living with Amy and Bob. And when Teresa graduated high school, Amy basically packed her all up and sent her away to go live with relatives out of state. And it was a very, very sort of dramatic and unhappy and not very kind way that this happened. And this allowed Roy to sort of jump in and be the savior here. And he was. They began to communicate again. And eventually, Teresa moved back into the area and lived with Roy. We spent a lot of time together. I didn't stop going to visit. Our visits changed a little bit. Roy's apartment was very small. But we continued to, to spend a lot of time. Our visits were what they had always been. They were dinners and museums, skiing, biking, hiking. We, we found things to do that kept us busy. And oftentimes Roy would come to New Hampshire and we would go to a bed and breakfast or stay in hotels or do what we needed to do to see one another. Sometimes he had huge enthusiasm for these visits. And I, I would sometimes just be a bit befuddled as in, you know, what's going on here? Why is he so happy to see me and 
And two weeks ago, he was angry to see me. And I believe now that a lot of those emotions came from the events that were happening in his life away from me. During this time, he developed a really strong friendship with a woman who I will call Alice. And she was actually really right up Roy's alley. She articulate, well-educated. She stood out in her community, very artistic and very into art, a good painter. She really was just everything that would attract Roy to somebody. And they started to spend a lot of time together. Roy's friends were always women. He has one good male friend, and that's the only one I know of. I know he has another good male friend now, but most of his friends always have been women surrounded by these females, all of whom he denies having any sort of feelings for. Looking back on it now and speaking with some of these people, I realized that that was always an undercurrent, always the possibility of dating, that most of the women that he would reach out to were people that he could see in his mind's eye dating. And so I would pick up on this sometimes. I will acknowledge that when I realized that he was either being dishonest or was going on quote unquote dates or setting up dates, I really overreacted because I'd lost everything. And my continuing connection to Roy was really based on survival, that I couldn't have lost everything for him and then lose him as well. That really is the easiest way I can say it. It doesn't make it right. doesn't make it healthy. But that's where I was at. I was dismantling my whole life and maintaining a relationship that had brought me nothing but tragedy and drama and grief because I felt like I needed to survive. In my research around doing this podcast, I find that so much of my behavior was classic behavior from somebody that suffered childhood abuse or neglect or trauma. All of my survival mechanisms are kicked in all the time. And every bond that works is one that recreates the negativity and the fear around trauma. Not that I want more trauma, but little girls and little boys get hardwired to it when that's what they know. And so I just continued out of survival to want this relationship with Roy. So the three parallel lives I'm living right now, my life with the girls and Kenny, my day-to-day life here in Concord, my professional life with Robin and my friendship with her and all of the socializing and CrossFit and all of the people that that involved. And then my relationship with Roy and the continuation of that. All of these things were occurring at the same time. And all of these things, every once in a while, something would bubble up and become an issue or a problem. I will say, as my friendship went along with Robin, she wanted things for me. She saw in me what a lot of people see, that I'm talented and smart, that I could be making a ton of money with like online coaching. Like I was so stuck in wanting to stay with public schools and stay in my little niche that I couldn't let go enough to allow myself to do great things. I look at my friend, Tom Walton, who exited exited the district much like I had years and years before. He just created a new life for himself. He just let the school district go. And I didn't. I kept rerunning for school board. I'm still on the school board. I attach myself to this because I feel like at the time, it brought me back to what my life was like before my job loss. And now I have all of Molly memories connected to that. During these years, 2013, 2014, and getting into 2015, I was living this three lives, all sort of going down the highway at the same time. And every once in a while, one will become predominant. When I think about just Roy and I, it really was maintenance. It was maintaining a relationship that both of us needed and wanted, obviously, but neither of us liked it either. I firmly believe, based on the fact that I haven't spoken to Roy in years now because he refuses to, that if he really didn't want me in his life all those years ago, I wouldn't have been in it. He doesn't do anything he doesn't want to do. He doesn't do anything that he doesn't see a positive outcome or some benefit for himself. Roy and I had a pretty intense chemistry and attraction. And I believe that that was a driving force sometimes in what kept him keeping me in his life. I'm also smart and I liked a lot of the things that he liked. And so we, we could always do what he wanted to do and I would enjoy myself and have a good time. I started to have a much bigger social life here at that time. Robin had this amazing way of of setting things up. So suddenly you're hosting a party. And I remember 4th of July, I think it was either 13 or 14. And I'm floating in the pool and I'm like, oh, it's a beautiful day. I'm just going to have this 4th of July day. And Robin says, I think I'll come over. Let's invite Jenna. And suddenly Jenna and her son, Sean, are there. And then Robin's family is there. And then my sister and brother-in-law show up. And so by the end of the day, I had a yard full of people. And it ended up being this amazing 4th of July. One of my favorite pictures of Molly is from this particular year, and she's got little flags on her head. You know, it was just this amazing 4th of July celebration. 
I went up and set that up. She facilitated that whole thing. She could she could create a get together in a moment's notice and often didn't have to host it, which makes me giggle sometimes. But so much of my social life was geared around Robin, Flips, and White Mountain CrossFit. I was there all the time. And I can remember Roy being very frustrated by these things sometimes. You like, you know, you have time for CrossFit competition, you have time for Robin, you have time for all of these things and no time for me. And he was right. I did create a life for myself up here that supported me socially and in the public eye, that made Gracie and Molly happy, and that made it doable for me to stay here. Kenny at, the, at this time was just slowly sort of tanking his business. He, he had specific instructions. We had a, this great IRS guy would come and talk all about what Kenny needed to do. And Kenny would nod and yes, I'll do it. And he would leave and Kenny would just continue along with what he was doing. And he really, really should have just closed the business years and years and years before he did. But he didn't. And it wasn't my business. And I needed to just let that go. I couldn't, I couldn't do everything. <laughs> it's my theme now in life sometimes. But that continued to be a downward spiral. So the coaching job in Bo was helpful for me, but it, it brought a lot of conflict, both with Robin. So you don't want to work for me, you want to work for them. She really wanted me to come full time and work for Flips. They started a whole ninja program, which has been incredibly successful. And I was offered the chance to create a whole outdoor ninja thing that went with this. Sky works for them now, an amazing company that does amazing things. And I could have had a big piece of that. And truthfully, I don't know why I didn't. It was the same barb that gets offered something amazing, wants to do it, and then just busies her life so much that months go by before she realizes she hasn't taken part at all. I just sort of disappeared. I imagine that was incredibly frustrating for Robin. I'm also pretty glad based on behavior since then that I didn't do because I'm not sure that being that connected with that family was in my best interest. As 2014 came to a close and 2015 arrived, things were really in a bubble now with uh, Kenny and the Roy Peace. Our Christmas of 2014 wasn't a great one. Financially, we weren't super, super great. We were okay. I didn't put together a great Christmas. I remember Gracie and Molly were a bit disappointed and I felt really bad. And so 2015 rolls around. Gracie and Molly are now getting older and Molly is incredibly insightful. And she starts to notice that I have this friendship with Roy and she doesn't always quite understand it. And she knows that that's what Kenny and I often fight about. She's 11, 13, turning 12 at this time. And Gracie is 13, turning 14. They're at the age now where they're starting to notice these things, where they're spending more time with their friends more time at home separate from us so they can overhear and see things. And, and I always, always explained that my friendship with Roy was around Teresa and Morgan. And, you know, Gracie would ask all the time how Morgan was because she remembered her as one of her best child friends. The beginning of 2015 had a pretty significant event. I had gone skiing with Roy and Kenny had figured it out and he was very angry. We had a huge fight about it, which made sense. Things of Robin and I were also really, really coming to a head. She was just starting to get irritated with me. And, and I remember just feeling sort of like it scared me, like, oh, no, 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 she's going to get mad at me. She's not going to be my friend anymore. And, and I had a whole social circle that really sort of evolved around her. The other thing that happened in, in this time period, 2013, is White Mountain CrossFit divided. John left the gym. And then a few months later, he opened his own called CrossFit Ironborn. And now we have one group of people that's now divided between two gyms. And I will say the owners, I'll just say this outright, did a horrible job of supporting the people in the gym. They wanted everyone to stay. When John opened his gym, I wrote a big article about it in Patch. And because I wrote the article, Concord Has Two CrossFit Gyms, I was sort of kicked out of White Mountain CrossFit. Brad and Ian just decided, you're not welcome here. You can't come here. And it was mind boggling that I couldn't support another CrossFit gym and go to one. And so I left the gym. They kept taking my money for like four months and eventually they invited me to go back and continue to work out there. So I worked out in two gyms and I was very, very open about that. All of 2014, I worked out both gyms and competitions for both gyms. It was uncomfortable. People didn't like it. It was uncomfortable for Robin. As we went along, my friend group at White Mountain started to get very, very tense. It just wasn't what it had been. And then White Mountain moved locations a couple of times. One of their last months in their big location, I put on a mustache mile of 5K. I sponsored a road race and not hardly any people came, but it was a wonderful day. But the whole transition of White Mountain CrossFit from one facility to the next was really divisive and tricky for me. And I felt less and less connected as these things happened. So all of this was happening at the same time. My friendships are, are bubbling up and having trouble. And Kenny and Roy, that whole thing is really bubbling up. 
So I have a, a stressful, a very stressful relationship with Robin. Roy is putting on the pressure now with Kenny. And then Kenny is figuring out and getting very, very angry about the Roy piece. So everything is sort of bubbling up at this time. We go skiing. We have a big fight. Molly witnesses this particular fight. Kenny and I are arguing. He pushes me into a shower curtain, downstairs bathroom. And the look on Molly's face was terrifying. And so, so I said, Kenny, you need to take this to the barn. So Kenny and I would often go out into the barn and fight out there because then at least the girls would know we're fighting, but they didn't have to hear it and be afraid by it. We agree that no more fighting in front of them at all. A couple of weeks later, it was Super Bowl Sunday. And so, of course, it's Super Bowl Sunday. We're drinking and everything else. And I had Melise here and Johanna was here. And there's food and pizza and alcohol. Not a ton, ton of alcohol, but enough. And, uh, and I had talked to Roy on the phone. But my phone rang again, it was Jonathan. And so I went upstairs because it was noisy. And I was, I was just lying on the floor. I slept on the floor at that time because I think my back hurt. I don't quite remember why. It also was good separation, I think. So... Kenny comes up, he's furious. He comes pounding up the stairs and he's not. So I'm like, so I'm saying goodbye to Jonathan. Now, I think Jonathan is going away somewhere. And I was like, well, have a good trip. I love you. So those words, have a good trip. I love you could also have been said to Roy because he was a pilot. And so he would go off on a trip, right? So Kenny was just livid and was, was sure that I was talking to Roy at that moment. And he just lost his temper and he just started pounding me and calling me. It was a very, very scary thing. Now he was, had had drinks and he was sick. So he wasn't, it wasn't, I never got a bruise on me. It's not like in the face. It was, it was, but I was curled up in a ball pleading with him to stop. He's pounding me. Gracie was taking the shower. So she's in the bathroom right next to us and she hears this and he's calling me names and everything else. And I'm pleading with him to stop. And Gracie starts crying. And I'm like, Kenny, you're making Gracie cry. Stop it. So Kenny gets up and he goes to the door. Okay, Gracie, everything's okay. You know, well, it wasn't okay. And so he goes downstairs. He had tried to drag me to the stairs. It was just crazy. So he goes downstairs and I didn't know at the time, but what he was doing was starting my car. And he was going to pull me out and put me in the car and make me leave, which of course it's, you know, nighttime on Super Bowl Sunday. I'm not going anywhere. So Molly called the police. And so <laughs> she hands me the phone. And so the police come and we go through this whole thing. And of course, Kenny is taken away. He's put in handcuffs and taken away. And uh, it's horrifying. And so I pack a bag and I put all his medicine in it, his glasses, everything he might need, because he can't, he can't be without all of this. And so he calls Katie and he called my sister, Johanna, I think, and she, she declined to help him. I'm not quite sure what happened, but it was a disaster. So Katie checked him into a hotel and, uh, and that was that. And so Gracie, Molly, Melissa, and I were there. So I believe Melissa left him home to her mother's house. It really freaked her out. I think her mother wanted her to move out. It made the newspaper, it made the patch site. My friend Tony has that site. And when he wrote the article, he referred to Kenny as my husband. So when I shared it with Roy, oh my gosh, look, look at this. What he saw was husband. And so his only response was husband, question mark. Because his, his feeling was that even though I was officially divorced, we were still living as husband and wife. And so it's not really changed. Roy and I talked all the time about the fact that I wasn't going to disrupt the girls' lives. And that, that if anyone was going to leave, it would be Kenny. That's how it had to be. And that's what happened. Shortly after this event, Kenny got an apartment. Now, logically speaking, he should have just gotten an apartment in Concord that was close, but he didn't. He got one like up north, an hour away from here. So what ended up happening is if he had a bad dialysis where he got sick or whatever, he would have to come here. And I wasn't going to not let him come here. This is where his daughters were. So yes, he had this apartment that he stayed in most of the time, but it wasn't really what it could have been. However, there were times that he and the girls were there, not here, and I had the house to myself. And I had a lot more freedom with Roy. And so I started pushing this. All right, it's happening. He's moved out. So now let's create more time together. Two things happened at this time. I went to Hawaii with Robin for her daughter's wedding, which meant Kenny came and stayed here for those 10 days with the girls. This really enraged Roy. He was furious that I would have time in my life to take off for over a week for Robin, but would never go away with him. You know, and of course my response was, well, who am I going to say I'm going away with? Because our relationship was still very much under wraps. And it was under wraps on his end as well. He didn't want to share with people in his life that he was dating what he called a married woman, even though I was no longer married. But it was for all intents and purposes, extramarital relationship the whole time for both sides. The aftermath of this was Roy decided that I really needed to work full time in Kenny's business. And the business couldn't fail, that the business had to succeed. So Kenny would have to get up at like five in the morning on the days he didn't have dialysis and drive down here. And we would go in the vending trucks and I would do all his vending. I have a picture of me sitting in a vending truck. Now I'm spending like 40 hours a week with Kenny. I'm not focusing on my VLAX and I'm not doing what I need to do. But I always, I cannot reiterate this enough. I always did what Roy said. I always 
all of his suggestions. I always did. He can deny it all he wants. When I look at some of the major decisions I made at that time, they were decisions that came from his suggestion I do this. My feeling is now that it was really, really true that I was going to show up and come, that he didn't want that to happen and backpedaled it. I started working full-time in the business and then trying to balance the VLAX. And that, that wasn't going to work. So now my VLAX performance is beginning to diminish again. And I had a very, very tricky time with the VLAX. I wasn't so good on the organizational piece. So the spring of 2015 was tumultuous. He, he lived away. He had an apartment for six months up north and the girls went up quite a bit. I went up a couple of times with the girls just to sort of see it. We furnished it. He was near his son, little Kenny, which was kind of nice. Kenny lived up there so they could have time together. But it was an illogical choice of a place for him to live because none of his medical care, nothing in his life was in Lincoln. It was all in Concord. And so, you know, it was just a bizarre, I'm not quite sure what was going through his head at that time. So spring into summer was tumultuous in that regard. The, the Kenny piece was tumultuous. Robin and I really started to struggle. And this was another thing when I look back on it now, it was so similar to how it was with Roy. I could never really pinpoint when Robin was going to be okay with something I was doing or not okay. A couple of things stand out in my relationship with Robin. One was in the fall of 2014. So it was a time, you know, months before I went over to leaf blow with her. She needed to leaf blow all the leaves to the road so the city would come collect them. I brought my leaf blower up and we had, it was such a fun time. We laughed so hard. Her dog, Louie, bit me in the vagina. <laughs> you know, it just, it was funny. We, did, we had a really good time. And I remember just being so relieved, like, oh, thank God, thank God they called. We had a good time. And it was just a nice, fun Robin and Barb moment. So I would hold on to those moments and those experiences all winter and spring with Robin, but it was tense and I could sense that it was tense. So now the two most major relationships in my life, aside from my children, Robin and Roy were increasing, increasing anxiety. The spring comes and it continues along and the school year ends and it's track camp. And that's like one of the busiest weeks for me. So track camp 2015 is going along and Robin comes to my house during that week and gives me a ticket to a concert. She's going to that Friday night. I tell her I can't go, that track camp is ending. I'll be exhausted. I have to time a road race that early Saturday morning. Now the road race was in Maine and the concert she wanted me to go to was also in Maine. But I would have had to come home from track camp, unload my car, load my car, drive all the way to Portland, watch a concert, sleep on the floor in a hotel room, get up at four in the morning and go time a road race. Completely impossible for me. But like I did, all the time, I said yes. And so I came home from track camp. I packed up my bags. I unloaded the car. I reloaded my car. I did it all. And I was on my way out of town and I'm falling asleep at the wheel of my car. I'm so exhausted. I can't even function. And I realized I've forgotten a connector for my phone charger and a connector from the, for the computer. And so I have to turn around. So I'm 45 minutes into my drive, I turn around. So now it's an hour and a half. So when I get home, it's 7.30. And so what I should have done right then is texted Robin. But what I said to Kenny was, you know what? I'll just lie down for a minute. I just need to close my eyes. And I did. I closed my eyes and I fell asleep. And I woke up at four in the morning. And so I texted Robin right away. I saw this whole string of texts from her. Where are you? We're worried about you. Where are you? Where are you? Why aren't you answering me? And so that was it. That was really the last straw with Robin. I didn't realize it at the time, but I had this hunch. Now, during track camp week, I drove by in the school bus from our swimming thing with all the track camp kids. I drove by my house and there's Robin in my pool. We all yelled hello to her. That was Wednesday. And Friday, it's essentially the end of our friendship. I pleaded with her, please understand, please accept my apology. She called me a liar. She said I was making it up. You know, I, <laughs> that's not a lie. That's me and my traumatic, busy, stupid, fill my life up with things that keep me from growing pattern. It was, it was a classic Barb weekend. So Robin and I now aren't speaking. And a few days after this, there was like a, an event at Flips, at her new Flips location, which is right next to the new White Mountain CrossFit location. So that whole friend circle was in this dress and drama now. And I thought, oh, good. Well, we're going to this event at Flips. Robin will be there. So I, I get there and Robin isn't there. And I asked Maddie, her daughter, where's your mom? Oh, she didn't feel good. Molly and Gracie loved Robin. Miss Robin was a huge piece of their life. And this is where I forgive, but I can't forget. This event happened. We brought Robin cake, we went to her house. I had Molly and Gracie ring the doorbell. And Robin was like, get out of here. I don't want to see you. Just get out of here. She was just mean texting me. And I'm like, Gracie and Molly are at your door leaving you cake. For heaven's sakes, it's not me. I'm in my car. Please come take the cake from them. They love you. And she refused. So we went home with this cake that she never wanted. And that was it. So I remember all through that summer, there were times that I couldn't move. I loved Robin. And one by one, all of our mutual friends stopped 
friending me, unfriended me on Facebook. And suddenly I was blocked from all these people that had been a huge piece of my life too. It was just bizarre. One by one, it was like the little Robin club all had to hate Barb together. I didn't know what to do. And I remember lying on the couch, just lying on the couch. And Molly and Gracie were so worried about me. And Gracie was incredibly sad. She really loved Robin. She has that tender heart. And Molly, Molly got it. Like, no, mom, no. And they, I remember they looked up little articles online about best friend breakups and things for me to read. They were so utterly, utterly helpful in this. While this is going on, I had this incident with Roy where he's just furious with me. I'd gone to a, prior to my friendship ending with Robin, I had gone to a concert in Boston. I remember we posted pictures and he was like, you're in Boston, you're right here. And he didn't tell me, you know, and I, from his perspective, I can see it. But there were plenty of other times and I did the same thing. I'm climbing a road race at Gillette Stadium. I post all these pictures. He's not unhappy about that. And he could have actually come down and hung out at that. So it was very inconsistent. I never quite knew when, when he was going to be upset with me and when he wasn't. I'm sitting on my, in my chair. And it's funny, when I get upset and it's nice weather, I just go sit outside. I look at my phone. I stare off into space. I just have to be still. And I spent a lot of the summer of 2015 alone and still. Because my entire social life had been built around Robin and White Mountain CrossFit. So I was developing new friends at CrossFit Ironborn. I was doing the best I could to reestablish myself, but I just felt gutted. And she was just a huge connection to my job loss and what made Gracie and Molly happy. And now suddenly, none of us existed for her. In that process, things with Roy and I became very, very heated. I'm not sure what precipitated it exactly. I never quite knew. But I do know that one of those days, I was sitting in, my, in the lawn and Roy and I were texting and he wanted to see me. And he was angry that we never saw each other and I have no life. And I said, look, I'll come down to know I have time now. And he refused and sort of disappeared on me. And then a few hours later, he posted all these pictures of him at a party with this woman named Alice. And so I was just, it gutted me because we had been texting. Why didn't he just say he was doing this? Well, because that's how it was. He didn't tell me. And I imagine he could say that that's how he felt when he looked at pictures of me doing other things. But I wasn't hanging out with other guys. My marriage was over. You know, I don't think he could see it that way. So that was a really tough blow for me. And about a week later, we had a similar situation where I'm sitting in the same chair in the same place on my lawn and we're texting away about what are you doing? And I'm just, you know, busy loading the truck to work with Kenny, you know, which, which I didn't really enjoy doing, but Roy had been insistent and we actually started to make money. We spent a lot of time trying to rectify and fix the business. Me not knowing that it was never going to be okay, that he needed to close the business. The IRS had given up ever hoping of getting their money back, that it was never going to be okay. But I didn't know this at the time. Kenny didn't share any of this with me. So here I am just doing useless work, which only, only hurts me or interferes with what's best for me. So we stop our talk. I go off to help Kenny. And I realize now that while we were having this text conversation and phone conversation, Roy was driving to my house. I didn't realize it at the time. I leave and go up to Sam's club with Kenny and Roy arrives at my house. Gracie and Molly are here alone. My sister Johanna has stopped by. So she sort of sees what's happening and sort of sticks around in the yard. And Roy just starts dumping my stuff into the lawn. Skis, a ski bag, clothing of mine, all these belongings of mine. He's just dumping over the fence. So I get this panic-stricken phone call from Molly. He had taken some artwork and some other things into the house. And so Molly and Gracie tried to lock the door. And in their frantic nature, they couldn't lock it. So they ran upstairs and hid in the upstairs bathroom. Roy walked into the house. Johanna sort of let him. I don't think she knew what to do. So she sort of just hung on about. He walked upstairs into the bedroom, which is where the bathroom is, put some things on the bed and he shook the bathroom door. So they're holding the doorknob in the bathroom. They're freaked out. They don't want him to come in. And he's trying to open the door. They're like screaming. So he, in their words, he just yelled at them. There's nothing to be afraid of. You're overreacting. And I can believe that he was, his voice was raised because I have seen this in him before. He will say, I'm not yelling. This isn't yelling. If you think this is yelling, you haven't heard me yell. That is often what he would say when he was raising his voice all throughout our relationship. So all I hear is a sobbing Gracie and Molly. And I'm like, is he still in the house? And she's like, we don't know. We're in the bathroom. And so by the time Kenny and I got home, he was gone. So of course I'm calling him on the phone and calling him the phone and he won't answer. He finally does. I'm like, why didn't you tell me you were coming? I would have been home. That isn't what he wanted. I don't know what he wanted, but 
And anyway, I put my ski bag in the barn. I put my big red ski bag in the downstairs closet. I hang the dresses in my closet. I take the artwork and put them in my closet. Like I put everything away. And Roy and I don't speak for a while. I don't really know what to do at this point. Everything is culminating now. And I remember just having this anxiety that my life is just exploding. That things with Robin, I haven't spoken to Robin now in about a month. And I have no friends. And Kenny is furious with me. At this point in time, Kenny and Roy also started communicating. Kenny would text Roy, Roy would text Kenny back. They would fight on the phone and I'd just be sitting there on the porch like watching this. And I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know what to do. They would fight over, you know, me. You know, she's lying to you. No, she's lying to you. So apparently I'm lying to everybody. And Gracie and Molly just tried to extricate themselves from it. A couple of other things we had done as a family, Kenny, Gracie, Molly, and I was go to concerts every Christmas. And these were family things that we did together, the four of us. And I would often post pictures of just me with the girls there. I admit I did this to not provoke Roy. But Gracie's Facebook page had everybody. So this became another bone of contention, all these family things I did with the girls. And I was clear with Roy, we're still their family. Kenny and I have no relationship, but we're still their mother and their father. And I just very much wanted to maintain that semblance here. All of these things, all of these things culminated and culminated and culminated. So by the time... July of 2015 rolled around. Everything was at a head. The final thing that happened, and sort of will end this episode, involves skydiving. So his friend Alice that I mentioned, she was an ongoing sort of issue for us. There was a while that I was friendly with her, although I never met her in person. He he never facilitated that to happen. But we were Facebook friends for a while. And I remember she, I think what happened is they maybe dated and then she decided she would prefer to just be friends. I feel that if she had really wanted to be with Roy, that he would have left me for her in a heartbeat. But they maintained a friendship, which is often what he does. The number of women friends he has that have have these former romantic or went on a date or two undertones, it's all of them. But he maintains these friendships. And some of them are healthy, and in my opinion, and some of them are not. I think his friendship with Alice is a nice friendship. They're friends now. But they decided to go skydiving. And skydiving was something that Roy and I had talked about a lot. And so this was all sometime in the 2014, 2015 time period. It kept getting rescheduled. It was bad weather once. They were sick once. It it just didn't happen. So it was finally scheduled for August of 2015. And so he talked about it and everything. So I don't know what happened, but suddenly she couldn't go. And so he had this skydiving ticket that he had to use. And in his words at the time, I can't find anyone anyone else to go with me. If you want to come with me, you can. And of course I wanted to go because I wanted to go skydiving. So, you know, we still weren't speaking all that much. That July of 2015 was not solid July at all for me in any way. It wasn't a good Kenny July. It wasn't a good Roy July. And it was an invisible Robin July. As the skydiving time approaches, which is early August, I say to him, shall I just meet you there early in the morning? Just give me, tell me where I need to be. And he goes, well, I haven't gotten that far ahead yet. Yada, yada, yada. And the time came. Now it was the week leading up to Saturday skydiving. And he says to me, come Friday night. Come Friday night. I'm going to be in Portsmouth. Come Friday night. Well, make a night of it. So this puzzles me because he's been furious with me and angry with me for the entire month, giving me all my stuff back. We're done. We're over. We're through. Okay, fine. Come skydiving. So this memory is hard for me because it's a look I've seen on his face before. And it's a look that kept me kept me, kept me. So I drive to Portsmouth. Of course, I'm lying to Kenny. Now I'm creating a visit with somebody else when I'm really going to see him. And he knows that I've been honest about who I'm skydiving. That much I've been honest with. I'm just trying to be big about who I'm staying the night. And so I get to Portsmouth and I part and Roy tells me where he is. And I get out of my car and I'm walking across the street. And he's taking a picture of a church and he looks over at me and he sees me and he breaks out into the most beautiful smile. <laughs> it makes me cry now because it's it's what I believed and it represents all that I really, really, really loved, loved about Roy and, and what kept me, kept me there. It was a smile that just made me feel safe and loved and needed and wanted. And I had all this relief rush through me. I was still a bit hesitant because I just didn't know. And we had this unbelievable evening, hand-holding and picture-taking and walking in the water and you know, sitting in the same side of the booth of the restaurant. And it was just, it was just like it was in the very beginning. And I didn't really understand and so I just said to him, are we okay, girl? Is everything okay? And he looked at me like, of course everything is okay. Why wouldn't it be? And so when I tried to bring up the clothing and the stuff, he just shut it off. That's done. That's over. I'm not, I don't want to talk about that. And so we didn't. And we went skydiving and we had this amazing time. And we had a wonderful day after the skydiving. 
he went home and I went home. And August sort of traipsed along. I'll end here because this is where there was a, a crucial turning point and everything blew ahead that culminated with the death of Molly. When I think about Molly and Gracie, and I think about Molly dying, when I think about these years of their lives, for the most part, these were incredibly happy times for them. And this is what my biggest thing was. When I talk to Gracie about it now, she doesn't really remember life feeling super unhappy until the months leading up to Molly's death, when things just got crazy on every level. As the summer of 2015 wound down, Gracie was entering high school. Molly was entering seventh grade. They had their cultivated friendships. Our connection to Robin was over. We were rebuilding ourselves from all of that. And I will say, one of the best things about the summer of 2015 was Gracie and Molly. We spent so much time together. I took them to the beach. I took them to the beach with their friends. Their friends came over. They went to their friend's house. I really do feel that with all of that drama and culmination, my two biggest distractions from life in this house, Roy and Robin, were ultimately almost invisible that summer. Robin was gone. And Roy and I were seeing each other far less than we had. I could do 10 podcast episodes on all the different ways that Roy and I maintained our friendship and relationship during those years. I look at the beginning of the end of Molly with the note in the backpack. And then the next big beginning of the end of Molly was key day when Roy showed up. And my next beginning of the end of Molly will be the end of summer of 2015. So there's that. You know, it's embarrassing for me to admit and acknowledge that, you know, I carried on a relationship for a lot of years outside my marriage. And then I ended my marriage and continued this relationship. I tried to maintain a happy family for Gracie and Molly. I repeated so many of the things from my own childhood that were hurtful for me and that were difficult for me. And there are times that I feel like a gigantic failure, a lot of times. I can't, I can't go back and fix it. I can't. I can't go back and repair any of the things. I can't fix the parts that I hurt in Roy. I can't fix my friendship with Robin. I can't fix my relationship with Penny. I can't go back and undo any of it. And so what I try to do is learn, learn from what was bad and then maintain what was good. And when I look at Gracie and Molly's life as Gracie and Molly, had Molly not died and they were able to continue what was happening in their lives, I believe they, they would have had wonderful high school years and will be having wonderful college and young adult years. I just choose to believe. And that was really my driving force. I look at all of the decisions I made and so many of my Roy decisions were made for his kids. And so many of my decisions here were made for mine. It was never about what's best for me. It really wasn't. And I know that that can be really hard to believe or appreciate for someone just looking at the fact that I was maintaining a relationship. I was desperately seeking approval and belonging and safety. And I recreated a traumatic existence for myself based on all of the things that were going on in my head as a trauma survivor. I look at Roy's piece in it and I look at Robin's piece in it. I don't know anything about the details of their childhoods and what made them the way that they are, but I was the perfect person for them. And I have to own that I was, and, and I have gone on to select many more Robins and many more Roy's in my life. And I look back before these two and I see them. And I understand that, that I'm gravitated to people that need help, but that I will never be able to help. And it reinforces my self-deprecation and my failure and my self-hatred. So that's it. That's where I'll stop on this episode. And I will retell the beginning of the end of Molly, 2015 and 2016. That will be another very difficult episode, but an important. Because in looking at all of the decisions and steps that led to Molly's death, these years are a crucial piece of it. Just maintained an existence that in some ways took me away from Gracie and Molly at times that they needed me most. And I wasn't able to utilize the best of Kenny or the best of Robin or the best of Roy because I was maintaining this, this juggling match. And the three of them were all willing to participate. Robin finally had had enough and stepped out. And sometimes I look at that as good for her. But Kenny continued to stay and Roy continued to stay, and I continued to scramble to keep sand in the sieve. That's that. So <laughs> I'm sorry to be so emotional. I'm, I'm recording this too after having just seen a dance competition. So I have all of this Molly in my head and all of the details of my life during each years. The last years of Molly's life were these years. And so it all comes back to me like a rush. And so that's why I'm so upset, I think. So... <laughs>
Be good to yourselves. Be better to yourselves than I have been to myself. Be good to someone else. Be kind to someone else. And as always, 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 have a good day, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening and for supporting the podcast. Feel free to leave a review and to share my stories with your friends. Please reach out with your own stories. I love connecting with my listeners. If you want to see what I'm up to next, you can find me on Instagram at barb underscore 444, on Facebook as Barb Higgins, and at my website, a thousandtinysteps.com. And while you're there, sign up for my newsletter, a weekly way to find out what's up in the life of Barb Higgins.